Hi, everyone. Welcome to the National Capital Area Chapter of the American Planning Association's um, four o'clock uh, session on um, advancing housing and equity in the Washington metropolitan region. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Don Edwards and the rest of the panel to uh, start the session. Um, please direct your questions during this session to the Q&A function located at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I wanna welcome everyone to this panel titled Advancing Housing Equity in the Washington Metropolitan Region. I'm Don Edwards. I'm the CEO of Justice and Sustainability Associates, an alternative dispute and engagement firm headquartered in the District of Columbia. I, uh, I hope and I think we should be well pleased um, to be joined by our panelists because each is well positioned, well informed, and well intended. And it, it is a critical subject that we're going to talk about in this panel. Um, but I first want to say a few more words about each of our panelists. Uh, Andrew Trueblood is the Director of the District's Office of Planning. Paul Desjardins directs Community and Planning Services for the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And Kimberly Driggins is the Executive Director of the Washington Housing Conservancy. I hope you all are going to stay and pay close attention to these experts, probably some of the most consequential experts on this subject in the district. And we wanna certainly have an opportunity for some questions and comments near the end. Uh, we will save some time and I will have a discussion period that I'll utilize some time with as well after they make their presentations. Presentations will take place in the following order. Andrew, followed by Paul, with Kimberly coming at the end. And then we will go into a brief discussion period where I talk with the panelists, and they will then all hear some questions from the audience. So please prepare them now. And as uh, Jeremy said, enter them in the chat function at around 1035, 1040. I'm sorry, uh, uh, 445 or uh, or so, 440, 445, 435, right around there. Um, so, uh, panelists, please remember to keep yourselves on mute until it's time for you to make your presentation. So, Andrew, over to you. Thank you so much, Don, uh, and thank you, fellow panelists uh, and uh, and APA and CAC for hosting us. This is a great. Uh, a great discussion, a great topic, and I'm excited to share with you a little bit about the District of Columbia's work uh, uh, around housing. So uh, the, this is well, only a five minutes. So if nothing else, uh, I will tell you that the, the key to my discussion and what I'm going to share is it's about scales. It's about thinking about housing uh, at every level, all the way from a, a place for an individual person or family up to the neighborhood, up to the city and the region and even nationally. Um, but let's start with the city. Uh, and the, the mayor has recognized uh, that District of Columbia, like many other cities and like other places in our region, has woefully, ha has not kept up with the demand uh, for housing at all levels and for all different types of families in the city. And so in 2019, um, looking at the data, uh, asking us to look at the data, she set a bold goal of 36,000 new homes by 2025. But she recognized, uh, while this is a big goal, uh, that it's not that's not the end of it. Uh, it's not just about the total number of housing, although we know we need that is necessary, but not sufficient. It's also about who the housing serves. So she created as part of that goal, a third of it uh, would be affordable. And that means rent restricted and income restricted um, by 2025. Uh, she went further and said it's not only about how much we produce for our city and where and, and for whom, but where. Uh, and, and this really starts to get to issues as we think about um, issues of racial segregation, um, historic and systemic racism, uh, and really how to undo uh, some of those things. And so um, based on some analysis, uh, wherein we set a goal of trying to create an equitable amount of affordable subsidized housing across our city by 2050, what would that look like uh, to really move the needle uh, on equitable housing uh, in our city. I should, rec I should actually start off by saying on the left, 
you'll see uh, a map that shows how much affordable housing is in each of our planning areas, our 10 planning areas. It, this was in 2018. So this is subsidized housing uh, in, 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 across our city. And you will see it's not uh, equitable. Uh, and it and is actually much higher in areas that are lower income, that are predominantly Black or African American. Um, and so how do we begin uh, to see uh, a city where there are opportunities, affordable opportunities across the city? Um, and that's where the mayor asked Office of Planning to look at what it would take to get there. And you'll see on the right goals uh, that ladder up to that 12,000 affordable housing unit goal uh, that would start to turn uh, the tide on uh, an, on an inequitable distribution of housing. Um, as part of this, we went and talked to a number of different residents. Uh, we went out, uh, the, we, we went and, and heard from residents. We did uh, surveys to see uh, what residents thought. Uh, we went to various events uh, and, and got a bunch, and, and it, a bunch of feedback and it all came back in the form of, or we put it into the form of a, what we call the Housing Framework for Equity and Growth or the Housing Equity Report. And that is available online. Um, so that's so that sets goals. That's good, and and they're ambitious, but that's not enough. Uh, and so that on the next slide, you'll see how we then um, began to trans. Well, I should I should take a step. I should say at the same time as we were doing this, we were also updating our comprehensive plan, recognizing uh, that equity is a critical component of our planning. Uh, and so we have um, some language around how we think about racial equity and how that intersects with housing. Um, and and you'll, you'll see it here. And it really is helping us guide our thoughts on how to make the city more racially equitable and just, uh, and how we translate these ideas and ideals into uh, actual changes uh, through land use. Uh, and so that, uh, if on the next slide, you'll see how we take these ideas and put them together. Okay, maps, uh, as you'll see behind me, uh, we love our maps. Uh, these you don't necessarily totally need to know uh, what it all means. Um, uh, for those who, who know the, uh, our work, uh, it'll look familiar, but I'll tell you generally, on the right is our future land use map. Uh, it guides our zoning, uh, even though it's not zoning. Um, and you'll, what we did uh, in our for, for the comprehensive plan update, given these goals, was we found opportunities in high opportunity areas, such as Friendship Heights, such as along Connecticut Avenue, uh, to create more density in those corridors. Uh, we think the, this is a critical way for us to create high, opportuni high opportunities, uh, housing opportunities in high opportunity areas. We followed that uh, on the left with areas where we, we recognize that in order to create that density, we'll need to look a little bit further. And that could be, for example, in Cleveland Park, uh, there's a historic district. How do we create more housing, more height, more density in a historic district? Uh, in the past, those two may be uh, conflicting, but we know that through design and through efforts and planning that we can find ways to create more housing. Friendship Heights, there's a lot of work to be done uh, there's a lot of opportunity as well. Even across across the across the line in, in Maryland, you see 200 foot buildings. Uh, so we know there's opportunity for housing and density in that high opportunity area, and we just need to look at how to get that done. And so that we we built that into changes in our comprehensive plan update that went to council in 2020, uh, and we're we're just enacted uh, this August. The next we'll see how. Um, it'll just and, and translate that. We actually then have to do the planning, uh, and so here you'll see in the areas that are that are um, that are uh, uh, kind of that lavender color uh, where we're doing existing planning. Uh, Chevy Chase, we have um, planning coming up up along Connecticut Avenue, along Wisconsin Avenue, uh, also major opportunity in New York Avenue corridor, as well as. Um, areas in uh, Ward 7 and 8 and 6 that we are also looking at. I would say what we found is while there's a, there's a focus on housing, I, I focused a lot of my, house, my, my discussion on housing production and affordable housing in high opportunity areas like uh, what we Ward 3 in Upper Northwest, there's still a lot of housing needs in areas like Pennsylvania Southeast. But that might be more of a home ownership opportunities, ensuring that residents get uh, to take a part in, in, in um, uh, in the way that their neighborhood uh, improves. And Congress Heights is a good example where we have the St. Elizabeth East campus, uh, where there's significant investment going in, where the, the Mystics uh, uh, home facility is and the Wizards practice facility is, uh, making sure that our residents are take a part of that 
and that 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 they're that uh, they can that housing is is for for them uh, and and for uh, is is creates opportunities to. I, I, I always hate saying anti-displacement because it's not anti, but it's pro uh, neighborhood and pro existing residents. So those are those are some of that's some of the work that that we're doing. Um, I, it's been five minutes already, so I, I think that's it. Although uh, Jordan, you can call me if okay, yeah. Uh, but I am excited uh, to transition to some work that I actually was excited to partake in. When we talk about scales, we know that uh, housing is it doesn't just happen; it doesn't end at the border. Of, of the District of Columbia. So we were very happy to work closely with COG in work and just, just our, and our, our regional jurisdictions uh, to come up with regional goals because housing is really a regional market. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Paul. Thanks, Andrew. That is an excellent segue, Don. I'm just gonna jump in if that's okay. Um, so most of, I see a lot of familiar faces in the list out there, so I'm hoping most of you are aware, COG, with the Association of the 24 Jurisdictions of the Region, we're also the MPO for Transportation Planning, and as Andrew said, among my responsibilities, I work very closely with the local government planning directors, like Andrew and his colleagues, and our local government housing directors. But I bring up transportation because so much of the conversation within the Council of Governments relates to the linkage between growth, transportation, the linkage between housing and jobs, and how can we best facilitate connectivity to people across the spectrum um, of all income levels and of all neighborhoods. So part of where we backed into this is on two fronts. About three and a half years ago, many of you remember, um, there was an announcement that we had won the prize and in fact, um, had been tapped to uh, become the location for Amazon's HQ2, the Amazon second headquarters that is now under construction in Crystal City. I bring that up in the context of, as I said, we spend a lot of time at COG talking about land use and transportation relationships, but this was the first time, the most recent time, an outside organization came to us and said, you know, you guys, you're not the Bay Area, you're not Boston, you're not Chicago or New York yet, but you guys really have to get a handle on your housing affordability problem because it is getting to be a bit of an issue. And we looked at it from a transportation land use perspective, as I said, and really framed it in the context of, okay, if we really are going to get the job growth that we think is realistically coming to this region, how much housing do we need, in fact, to support all those jobs? So could we move to the next slide, please? So again, worked with the planning directors and the housing directors of the region, the chief administrative officers, the board at large elected officials. Again, uh, the mayor is a part of our board as is you know, uh, the, the county executives from Montgomery and Prince George's counties and so forth. And beginning in 2018 and proceeding through 2019, we had a very serious conversation about what does that mean? How can we do a better balance, if you will, of jobs and housing in this region? As Andrew said, it was very intense, it was very iterative, and it was very granular, looking at opportunities in local government comprehensive plans, which you saw in Andrew's maps on the wall, for example. But it was also looking at very specific focused areas. So in 2019, September 2019, as you see there, the COG board unanimously adopted three specific targets. First, if you believe this premise, as I said, that we're going to get the number of jobs that we're anticipating over the next decade, then we need 75,000 more housing units on top of what we're already assuming, which was 245,000. We need 320,000 total net new housing units 32,000 units a year um, between 2020 and 2030, just to provide a sufficient amount of workers for the jobs we reasonably think we're, we're gonna get. What I should have said, and I think some of you who follow the MPO process is part of that conversation is because we have an extremely limited transportation uh, uh, budget, meaning there is not a lot of latitude. Every dollar, we are fiscally constrained. We can't build every project that is planned and proposed. And so on the ledger, if you will, we do need to account for this balance between jobs and housing when it comes to transportation investments. The second target, we want 75%, and you see there's a pattern here, 75 and 75. We want 75% of all this new housing to essentially be in the right places. And 
What do I mean by the right places? What we call activity centers or near high capacity transit stations. It's a smart growth construct. We're all good planners. And years ago, we, COG, with our planning directors, uh, identified a map of activity centers, places like Friendship Heights, like Bethesda, um, you know, different neighborhoods throughout the region that are planned for future growth. That is where we want the majority of the new housing to go. Um, the downside and the challenge is there's you know, some, some issues that will come into play to add additional housing into an existing, existing neighborhoods. And then that third target, again, unanimously adopted by the board with the planning director support, 75%, again, 75, 75, 75, 75% of all this new housing, 240,000 out of the 320 should be affordable to low and middle income households. And for those of you who are um, more versed in housing policy, we're talking about up to 120% of AMI. So this is cutting across the spectrum of just good, hardworking people throughout the region. Next slide, please. I should mention, one of the things I should mention, and Andrew alluded to with the mayor's targets, four of our jurisdictions have actually adopted policies where they have set targets. So the district, as Andrew mentioned, Montgomery County, Maryland, City of Alexandria, and Prince George's County have of their own volition all adopted numeric targets for how much additional housing growth they'd like to see over time. One of the things we talked about with this journey with the planning directors were, what are some of the impediments to uh, you know, actually creating more housing? Obviously, it's, it's the market forces, the cost of dollars, you know, developers will tell you delay costs money. But we also learned there are challenges from sort of the regulatory side of things. The development community would also tell you red tape is going to hold up a development process. And then the third is what we referred to as the sort of community dynamics. It could be a positive support or it could be a negative support like or negative reaction like NIMBYism. So something we have done is we've partnered with um, uh, Dr. Tiffany Manuel, who used to be at Enterprise Community Partners and now runs an organization called Case Made. And a year ago this month, we released this report that you see called A New Narrative for Housing, Playbook for um, Housing in the Greater Washington Region. It calls out best practices. It calls out examples around the country where there have been successes, but really to address those three impediments I just mentioned about um, you know, particularly uh, you know, the regulatory barriers and, and uh, community activism, and uh, NIMBYism and whatnot. And then last slide, please. And then lastly, this is something we're, we're very proud of. And again, we began this effort about two years ago. This is for the first time in probably close to 20 years, we are doing a comprehensive regional analysis of the impediments to fair housing choice. Um, it's a long history of when there were, in fact, requirements by uh, the, the federal government to undertake this type of a study and a, an analysis at the local level. But then that sort of dropped off in the prior administration. But regardless, all of our member jurisdictions agreed to join hands and look into these issues of what can be done to ensure that there is, in fact, quality of life affordable housing for people throughout our region and really to address proactively equity issues and concerns about what are these impediments that are preventing housing production, uh, particularly in the areas where uh, the, the residents really, really would like to see that growth. So I'm going to wrap up my comments there and turn to Kim. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, next slide, please. I'm Kimberly Driggins, and as Don said, I'm the Executive Director of the Washington Housing Conservancy. And uh, we are a relatively new not-for-profit 501c3. We were established in 2018. And our, our mission is to preserve affordable housing, uh, avoid um, or prevent displacement and promote economic mobility particularly for moderate to low income African-Americans and other residents of color. Um, we are a specific, next slide. We are a, a, a specific um, intervention. Um, we're very clear about what and who we are. 
And we um, were in the NOAA, which is the naturally occurring or market rate affordable space. So this is the housing that's being lost at the greatest rate um, across the area and across the entire country. This market rate affordable actually has no protections outside of HUD Section 8 voucher tenants. There is no place-based subsidy to the NOAA housing, which is why it's being lost at the greatest rate in the market, no matter where you are in the country. So we are very specific in terms of the market that we're in. We are also um, you know, focused on workforce housing. And I really actually hate that term, but it's an industry recognized term because I think all, all people work the, regardless of what income level you are, but workforce um, tends to um, focus on middle income workers or um, folks that have like your teachers, your first responders, your nurses, um, folks that actually make a decent living, but their wages have not kept up with the cost of living. And they also make too much money to qualify for subsidized housing. So we're looking at a housing universe that has no uh, affordability covenants on it. And we're also targeting a group of folks where they make too much money um, to qualify for uh, subsidized housing. So we're very um, targeted and specific in terms of who we're trying to help. This market is very much being, we're, we're losing this fight um, to preserve affordability. Most of this product goes to value add for-profit developers. So WHC, we are disrupting the market, right? We are, we are really um, in this space where there's very little policy um, and there's no protections um, to keep this housing product in the market. And so we're disrupting the market and what makes this type of housing difficult to maintain. Um, we're also thinking about how residents can thrive in place. So for us, it's not just about stabilizing your housing and making sure that your rent, you're not overly rent burdened, but it's also thinking about what can we do to promote economic mobility for our residents in our housing properties. Um, and I, we think that we are um, innovating and providing a new model that's bringing um, access to private capital and being able to move at speed um, to preserve this type of housing. Next slide, please. We also have a very strong intentionality around racial equity. And this is, this is the buzzword of the day. I hear it almost every day um, in conversations. And we were thinking about racial equity long before um, last summer and even before I joined the organization but I wanted to talk specifically about how we are promoting um, advancing racial equity. And it really breaks down in the following manner. Um, we're really looking at the structural inequities and we've heard this from Andrew and we've heard this from Paul around where the housing is. So we're actually focused on high opportunity neighborhoods and they dovetail very closely with the definitions that Paul and Andrew gave, but I will, add a little bit more to that, um, and high quality housing. Um, these are, these are um, both things that traditionally people of color have not necessarily had access to, is quality housing and high opportunity, at high, in high opportunity neighborhoods that's reasonable and that's not um, expensive. We're also looking at biased, um, implicit and explicit bias in property management and resident services. So we have an anti-racist approach to our social impact strategy and how we engage residents in our mixed income communities. That's making sure that we're promoting an atmosphere of trust and respect and making sure that uh, people who are at the lower income bands are not being marginalized or othered um, in our environments. And we know that there needs to be intentionality to make sure that that's not the case. We also are promoting levels of voice and agency and decisions about community life. So we are very proactive about resident empowerment and thinking about um, how we are giving voice to agency, voice and agency to residents. 
we are not just about um, doing resident services or community building events for residents, but really looking for resident leaders. And it's a co-creation model. Um, and lastly, we're thinking about how are we creating a sense of belonging and um, you know, how are we connecting across lines of difference amongst our residents and staff? And so really an intentionality to that. Next slide, please. So I mentioned before where we focus. This is a map of the high opportunity neighborhoods and we've used all of the data that Paul and um, Andrew have used. And you know, we, we're defining high opportunity neighborhoods in the following manner. We're looking at one, access to quality transit that's either rail or high quality bus. We're looking at access to safe and stable neighborhoods where schools um, are, are either the test scores are good or the test scores are rising in terms of quality of inclusive schools, access to fresh and healthy food, uh, support um, in terms of civic associations, and most importantly, where there is population growth. We're looking at census tracts where it's 50% or higher in terms of population growth and where there's market pressure or displacement pressure. We operate in the DMV, uh, DC. You can see almost all of DC is uh, shaded with this violet um, or lavender. Northern Virginia, as well as Montgomery County and Prince George's County. Um, we have our first two properties under our um, that we've, we've acquired this year with another two more closings um, by the end of the year. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm gonna end there, but I do wanna just um, point out a, a couple of things. Um, with workforce, I just wanna define, we're looking at 60% of AMI up to 120. Our communities are mixed income, so we will have lower income, um, lower AMI bands and market rate. So our fixed variables are that we will always have a mixed income community, that we are always looking at multifamily in terms of buying existing apartment buildings. We are preservation, not new construction, and we are really focused um, in these high opportunity neighborhoods. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Don um, so he can lead us in conversation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, uh, Kim and Paul and Andrew. And as uh, we all know that when others go low, we go high, and we're gonna proceed on that direction. So I wanna start by recognizing that with your expertise, help some of us in the audience to understand why so much attention to housing equity. And I'd like each of you, let's start with, with you, Paul, and then Kimberly and then Andrew, what, why, why does this get so much attention? What, what's the big deal? So it's a good question, John. I think it really helps frame the conversation. I mean, from the most basic standpoint, the issue is we want housing for all of us and for our children, for your family, for your coworkers, people you know and interact with on a daily basis. I mean, it, it, it sounds trite, it sounds like it's a cliche, but it's the right thing to do. Our market has changed so much in my lifetime. I grew up here, but the housing affordability problem that we have today was something we would have never imagined 20, 30 years ago. I mean, it's, it's an issue. Uh, equity in particular is a policy, a, a challenge that the board of the council of governance has taken on and believes in very strongly. Just this past year, we reemphasized not only the housing targets, but this spatial lens of an equity focus, what we call equity emphasis areas, neighbors, neighborhoods where there are concentrations, uh, large concentrations of low-income households, minority households. It is, it, it's, it's pretty much in our DNA as a planning organization. And that's, there's my last point. I will stop here is COG's a planning organization. We're not bricks and mortar. So we're a little, you know, hamstrung, if you will, that we can advise, we can begin the conversation, but it's a bit harder for us to, to actually implement, which is why we do rely on people like Andrew um, and Kim to, who are actually making this happen, if you will. Thank you, Paul. Kim? Yeah, you know, I, I didn't mention in the intro, but I, I have planning roots. I was in the DC Office of Planning for um, seven years, and so I'm well versed in what um, Andrew and Paul are engaged in and um, deeply believe um, that 
you know, having been in the, the DMV for over 20 years now, that housing equity is really one of the most, it's top three in terms of pressing issues um, for our region. And I'm so, um, it's so great to see the work um, that DC Office of Planning and Paul's organization, COG, um, the work that's being um, put out there and not just put out there, but actually listened to. So it actually made my job easy when we started to think about, okay, where do we want, the data was already there and it was already very clear about where we wanted to have impact. And, you know, I think that you need a lot of housing solutions. And I think that it's, you know, expanding the tools and the toolkit to meet this challenge. I think Paul's report is very compelling about the shortage. And so it's an and both. Um, I think that, you know, where WHC has decided to carve out space is a space that really, there's not that many players in it. And the folks that are in it uh, tend to be for-profit developers that aren't necessarily thinking about affordability, especially in this um, NOAA or market rate affordable space, but that actually is um, the lowest hanging fruit. It is already there. It's always cheaper to preserve than create new. Um, and you don't have to go through, it's, 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 it's uh, cheaper and it's quicker because you don't have to go through zoning. So, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there, let Andrew chime in. But um, I think that you need multiple solutions and working at different income scales to really achieve housing equality um, in this region. Thanks. Uh, I, I guess I I agree with with what has been said. I, I'm trying to add and extend the conversation. I guess. I would say what's so fascinating about housing and why it resonates is because it works at all these different levels. It is a place that all of us experience. We all have our homes. Um, it's an individual experience. It's an identity, who, where your neighborhood is, what school your kids go to, what school you went to. Uh, you know, it, it, and and um, at the same time, it's also a market. It's related. It's, it's a it's a way to build wealth, but it's also it, 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 it is, it's defined by interest rates that happen at the national level and by banking products and by global and even global supply chains, as we've seen. Uh, so, it, you know, it, housing is this really interesting, complex thing, and it's multifaceted, but it's something we all experience. And I think as it relates to equity, I think we're seeing the place-based realities of inequities are almost, almost always tied to where someone lives, whether you're talking about health equity, environmental equity, educational outcomes, economic outcomes, transportation equity, which is something that, that Paul has mentioned that I know TPP is working on because I've, 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 I've worked with them on that. So I think that to me is why it is at the center of all of these discussions about equity, because where you live uh, has, has, has an implication on all of those things. Just one final point. Um, to hit it home. Uh, Don, you know this, and, and Kim, you probably know this, although I don't know if I've ever said this in the same room as you, but in the District of Columbia, uh, when you look at the um, life expectancy by ward, we have eight wards, the, the gap between Ward 3, Upper Northwest, you know, Upper Northwest Friendship Heights, and Ward 8, uh, which is Southeast, uh, or parts of Southeast, uh, is 15 years. Uh, that is, those places are six miles apart. Um, but they're tied to every to income, to race, and to ultimately location. So I think that's why uh, it's so critical that we have these conversations now. I would just like to echo um, or just really emphasize the, the last point that Andrew just made. We do know housing equity is so important because we know that zip codes matter. We know that zip code often determines your life outcomes. It's not the sole predictor, but it's a pretty reliable indicator about what you will go on to do in life. And I think that, you know, we've known this for decades. Um, you know, my parents chose to attack this from the education lens and I've chosen to take, uh, address it from the place-based um, built environment lens, but where you grow up um, really does influence your life outcomes, life expectancy, what you have access to. So it really is ground zero for really leveling the field um, around what you can do um, and what you're exposed to in life. And it, it's just very critical. 
Uh, we have a couple of questions in the uh, Q&A, and I'm going to call on them in, a, in just a second. I said I would and I will, but I want to ask the panelists one more, I think, critical question. You know, we're facing a pandemic. We're facing many, many headwinds. What measurable progress can you report that we can feel some encouragement as we tackle this very critical problem? Uh, and this is not a recent problem. We know that it's taken probably some decades. So we're not looking for miracles, but what progress can you point to? And I'd like all of you to just start talking about that. And maybe we start again with you, Kim, um, as a way of recognizing your role in intervening in a particularly new and important space. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged um, mainly uh, when I look at the work that we've done in, in the region about, it's a more nuanced um, analysis than I've seen in other places. I recently spent some time in Detroit and you know, the conversation there was about units. Um, it wasn't necessarily about where. So I'm encouraged just by the fact that we're saying that you know, our region needs to care about housing, um, affordable housing, and the distribution and where that housing is. That wasn't necessarily what we were talking about five or even 10 years ago. You know, affordable housing tends to go where the dirt is the cheapest because we know that there's so much subsidy that's required to create affordable housing. So that's where you get the concentrations um, of low income housing. And we know that that's not good um, for inclusive communities. So I'm encouraged by the current conversation around where, around where, and, and really taking um, you know, serious stock around historic isms, racism <laughs> around housing and and really um, the acknowledgement um, where we have failed, quite frankly, um, to produce inclusive communities. And we know, you know that you know, it, there's been a lot of um, housing segregation and it's not gonna change overnight, but I'm encouraged about where, um, where we need, where the pressure is to produce this affordable housing. Um, so uh, I'll, I have two answers to that. So one is we put these metrics out, so we have to track them that I mentioned. So 36,000, we're about almost 50%, we're about 46% of the way towards a 36,000 number. We're about 26% of the way towards the 12,000. So obviously, you know, part of that is it's hard to do affordable housing. Uh, but that gets me to the next piece, which is we're tracking, we're holding ourselves accountable, but we're also, as and Paul mentioned, is putting the tools in place. Uh, so we, the mayor put in, four, and, and the tools also means the money, uh, the mayor put in $400 million into our housing production trust fund, which is four times as much as she's been putting in every year before. Uh, and that takes us to a billion dollars uh, overall since the mayor took office, uh, which is uh, really uh, blows every other city uh, out of the water uh, in terms of per capita. Uh, in the country, really. Um, and we know that this is this is how we change the tide in terms of the production of housing and especially uh, very low income housing. But we've done other things like we have a tax abatement for high opportunity areas. We improved inclusionary zoning uh, so that if you come in asking for more density or a map amendment, uh, you will provide a higher percentage of affordable housing. Uh, so that's tied to some of the work we're doing in the comp plan. So there's a lot of great groundwork laid. Uh, now we need uh, now we need to implement it and 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 see it happen. Paul, so I, I was going to add a couple things, Ed, and I think Kim and, and Andrew have given fabulous examples. It's sort of interesting in my career in the '90s. Cog started a program called the Washington Area Housing Partnership, was advocating for the need for more housing, and so we had enterprise community partners and a number of uh, other regional and and local entities involved in that. Well. I'm also was around 12 years ago when two of our jurisdictions had the highest foreclosure rates among all the jurisdictions in the entire country. Prince George's County and Prince William County in Virginia were right up there. So it's, it's, I'm so mindful of how much the pendulum has swung back. The one thing I would say again is when, when we've looked at this, I mean, we've, we're all planners in this forum 
something we've adopted at COG is the term, you know, everybody knows what TOD is, transitorian development. We've adopted, and it goes to the heart of what Andrew and, and Kim said about making great communities. We've adopted the construct of transitorian communities, meaning it is housing for everyone, it is mixed income, it is mixed use, but it's really weaving into the fabric in the right places all these desirable amenities with equity in particular, again, through our, our uh, fair housing impediments study right now, uh, which hopefully will be out uh, in about six months. So stay tuned, we'll have some very good results from that. Okay, panelists, thank you. I'm going to recognize some of the questions we've gotten uh, and I'll direct them to uh, those where I think it's most relevant. Uh, Andrew, um, this is from you, Morris, and I thank him. And I, uh, I'm all for bringing more affordable housing into the Upper Wisconsin Avenue area. As you probably know, the schools in the area are over capacity. And I'm wondering what investments in additional school capacity the city might make. Yeah, I, I think it's actually like a fundamental misunderstanding uh, to tie housing to schools. I think it, it's kind of like a natural thing, but uh, as we've seen in our Montgomery County, new housing actually doesn't necessarily create schools. What drives school, especially in a city like the District of Columbia, where school choice is an option, is good schools. So if the schools are good, they're gonna be overcrowded and people who have resources are going to want to go there. Uh, so I think the fundamental thing is first showing folks the data uh, that, that there's not a connection, uh, a really important connection there, uh, but that we need to address school overcrowding, right? So like, it's not to say that's not an issue. And um, I, the mayor has taken a strong stance uh, towards addressing these issues, acquiring properties. And it's certainly something we're working very closely uh, with uh, uh, the DC public schools and the, Depart the deputy mayor for education on. But when you have a city like school choice, uh, that nexus, it's oftentimes more uh, like Paul was saying, it's more of a reason not to do something. Uh, and it's not something that, uh, I, you know, we have to talk to the neighbors and, and level with. Uh, it is something we will have to level with them on, but it's not, uh, it's not a reason not to build housing. And especially it's not a reason not to build high opportunity housing in areas that are highly segregated. Uh, I just, you know, it's, it's a consideration, but it's not going to stop, uh, I think, what we need to do as a city. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to direct this one is from uh, Stephen Krim, and I, I will mention it with uh, Paul and then maybe Kim. Um, Paul, you mentioned community dynamics as an important barrier to promoting equity and production. Kim, you mentioned your work promoting voice and the community to create equity. Kim, is WHC organizing with residents to speak at public hearing, hearings in favor of projects that add housing in addition to preserving affordable housing? Um, I think both of you can, can kind of talk about this from the standpoint of uh, what you're both doing. Kim? Okay. Um, so we haven't organized residents to show up at hearings. I think one, that's a little bit out of scope um, for our mission. We are very focused on, um, exclusively focused on preservation. So, you know, the it's already zoned. There's really no, there's, there's, no, um, there's no hearing to attend. We are actually very focused though on resident engagement and really thinking about the quality of life of residents within our buildings and what the look and feel of that is. So the buildings that we typically buy, they're class B, class C buildings. So many of these um, are 1960 or 1970 construction that don't have the same types of um, amenities or shared spaces that these newer buildings have. So we're really thinking about how residents can come together. Um, as it pertains to economic mobility, we are thinking about, you know, what are the levers that help promote economic mobility, whether that's financial literacy, whether that's thinking about daycare, we know that's the second highest expense, where, whether that's thinking about workforce development. Some of our properties have a lot of children and youth and so thinking about how we engage youth um, is actually something that we're also focused on. But with respect to, um, you know, I think the question, that's a little out of scope for us. Um, you know, I'll see if Paul wants to weigh in, but that's not, that hasn't been our focus, um, at least in the first two, two to three years of operation. Thanks, Kim. Paul? Sure, so I, I can add a couple of things. I mean, one, 
is always the question of just, you know, the, the dynamic of there's a project coming into my neighborhood. And so there's this sort of fear factor of, oh, my Lord, it's going to overwhelm the fabric. It's going to be a massive high rise building or, or just what have you. And so plan directors and probably many people in this forum have seen, and I forget the architect's name, but there's a wonderful graphic that talks about the continuum of housing. And it starts from small single family homes you know, on detached lots, and that goes all the way up to, you know, massive high rises at the other end. But why do I bring that up? Because most often we're trying to talk about things in the middle. If you're trying to integrate into the fabric, the structure, and that's what I'm talking about here is the design, it's something in the middle. And so it could be a duplex, it could be, you know, four or four, you know, it could be all sorts of different structure types. So some of it is that low bar of just let's let's talk about, you know, it's sort of like a visual preference. Sorry. Let's talk about what this thing is going to look like. The second piece, and, and Kim talked about this earlier too, is really the message. And again, we've done this at COG over the years, is the message of putting a face on who are who are these housing units for? And, and Kim's correct. We did a massive campaign in the 90s over public servants, nurses, teachers, police officers, firefighters, and so forth, to drive home the fact, and it's still true, these are folks from your neighborhood. These are people you know, the people you encounter, people who work with you, people you know who your life may depend on to really sort of help drive home why wouldn't you want someone like this in your neighborhood? They're, they're, they're your friend, they're your partner, they're, you know, someone you already have a relationship with. So sort of soft answers with, with both of them, but it's something you know, we've wrestled with. And we've tried advocacy in sort of a soft touch level. I'm sorry, Don, I, I, I think I cut you off just then. But it, it, it's tough for us. I mean, we're a membership organization, so I we can't go and lobby a member local government and you should do A, B and C and D with a project. That's that's really not what we're about, but we can provide objective materials like, like Dr. Manuel's guidebook about, well, did you ever think about doing bonus densities or did you ever think about doing accessory dwelling units, which is a, you know, a type of policy that's being implemented here. You know, people talk, we brought the Minneapolis housing director to our board retreat where you know, we talked about the fact that, okay, maybe you can introduce something more than single family zoning into your jurisdiction. So it's more sort of the educate, what, what kind of is we try and help have a, have a discourse, have a forum where some of these ideas can come forward. Thank you all. Uh, <clears throat> Michael Farrell sends, we have a significant experience with affordable housing in central DC and with public housing that has remained in place while the surrounding neighborhoods have become upscale. What do the inequalities of outcome, health, life expectancy, education, crime, et cetera, look like in these communities? And Kim, I think his last question is, does close physical proximity of well-off and poor populations make a difference? Maybe all of you would like to speak with that a little bit. I think it definitely can make a difference. I think that we not we have not responded well. I think that, you know, mixed income communities are always preferable to um, a, a high concentration of poverty. Um, but that question, we still have concentrations of poverty. So like the public housing in these revitalizing areas, I wouldn't say that that's mixed income. This is actually like a concentration that's within a neighborhood that's actually changed. So there's a relationship between where, you know, the housing and where it sits and its relationship to community. And I don't think that we've done a very good job at that at all. Um, there's, I mean, you know, you can have a whole nother panel on, on the DC Housing Authority and the challenges that housing authorities across the country are facing um, with respect to its aging stock. But in terms of the question around the value of mixed income communities, there is a value proposition there. We know that economic mobility, a lot of the economic mobility, um, a, a large piece of it is, actual, is actually social capital. The people that you're interacting with when you go to the store, um, the people that you're interacting with in terms of your kids who they're in school with, um, school is actually, uh, one of the places where families of different economic backgrounds interact 
Um, and I think that that can be a powerful way of making social connections that can um, lead to um, uh, expanding opportunities. So I think that it, there's value. I don't think that we um, as a country have actually really peeled back the onion around, you know, difference and, you know, crossing the street and, you know, crossing, um, you know, how do you bridge, um, you know, interacting with people who are not um, from where you're from, your background. And I think there's more work to be done there to actually make mixed income communities truly successful and truly integrated. Just because you're living in close proximity doesn't mean that you're actually interacting with people who don't look like you. And there needs to be an intentionality around that to actually make mixed income, to realize the vision of mixed income communities. I find it so interesting that, you know, you focus on <clears throat> communities of uh, concentrated low wealth. Almost no conversation takes place about the limitations imposed by concentrations of high wealth. And I think that that's always something that needs to be incorporated into what you just said. Um, I will tell you that we are running out of time and I, I always feel bad about that because we are fascinated by this conversation. I know the audience is. I wanna give you each an opportunity to say a little bit more. <clears throat> and I'd like you each to focus in on partnering. How is your collaboration going on? The three of you right here, well, let's just say that if you could wave your magic wand, I'm pretty sure we'd have this problem solved here in this region. But if we could talk about that a little bit, I think that would be a strong note on which to end this panel. So Andrew, I'm gonna look at you first. Yeah, I think it's funny you say that. Uh, we're actually putting together this roadmap for how we're gonna, how we think we can get to 2000 affordable units in Rock Creek West. And what we've realized is the call to action is this is a responsibility of everybody. Uh, it's not just the government, it's not just the nonprofit housing providers, it's not just the for-profit housing providers, it's not just COG, it's residents, uh, it's faith-based institutions. Housing is, it requires, it requires buy-in from everybody. Uh, and I think sometimes uh, folks that think it's just the government or maybe just the government and developers, uh, like capital D, like evil developer, uh, but it isn't, right? It is, it's an, it, 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 it requires lots of um, various uh, folks to come in together. And I think how you see in this panel, I think is hopefully a, a hopeful sign of how we're all working together, but there's still more to do. And, and that includes working with our neighbors. That includes working uh, with our agent, other fellow agencies like the Housing Authority. So uh, it is complicated. Uh, there's not just one uh, agency or person that owns it, but that's uh, what we need to do in order to change the system. Oh. Sure. Thanks, Don. And thanks, Andrew. I think that's a good point. Um, I'm going to call up something that Andrew remembers many years ago when we were on this journey. We actually had an image that we sort of called the constellation of different partners. And who did we bring to the table? COG brings together the member local governments, right? But we also needed to bring the business community. So we had the Board of Trade, but we also had the Greater Washington Partnership, the 2030 group, we had people in the business community who were starting to acknowledge, now, this is a problem that is going to impact my bottom line if I can't have workers, happy workers close to their place of employment. But we also had good strategic partners on the other side of the equation, the Urban Land Institute, who is the association, of the development community, um, the apartment, AOBA, the Apartment and Office Building Owners Association. There was a moment two years ago where we really did have this sort of mutual agreement. I don't wanna say an epiphany or a synthesis, but it was really a diverse group of people from all disciplines who said, this is something we need to own and we need to act on. And I will say again, it is now once again, a priority for our board of directors. So I think as we've rolled out the toolkit last year, I think you'll see COG, working with our members and again through these partner conversations we've hosted over the years, um, really trying to lean in more, but, but it's a tough nut to crack. And I will end with this. We want to do 32,000 units a year. We're doing more about 22, 24,000, but I have to give a shout out to Andrew and the district because out of all 24 jurisdictions, the district has been really leading 
everyone in terms of housing production, multifamily units in the district, far and above any jurisdiction in the region. Um, so major, major kudos um, to uh, Andrew and, and, and the DC government. Yeah. I'll just say that um, building off of what Andrew and Paul have said, I would say that partnership and collaboration is important. I think we need to do better at expanding um, our collaborators. So, you know, you talked about, you know, the regional competitiveness issue, but employers actually aren't necessarily dialing in to housing the way that they could be. Um, you see that that is the only sector that has, um, in my opinion, has been the tech sector. Um, and mainly because they've had to. Um, Google, Google, Facebook, Amazon, you know, they, you know, when you look at where they are, Northern, Northern California, the Bay Area, um, Boston, New York, and now, you know, DC, um, they've leaned in in a way that I would wish that other employers would with respect to their commitment to solving um, some of the challenges that their presence helps um, is, is creating more pressure, right? It's, it's, a, it's already, um, you know, an, a, an area that has pressure, but, you know, their, their presence um, is adding to it and they really understand that, but they're not the leading um, sectors in the DMV. Education and hospitals are um, also, you know, looking at defense and looking at, you know, I'm not going to call it any one corporation, but there are, um, you know, a lot of companies, just like how they think about sustainability, they should be thinking about housing. And I think that that's, you know, to solve this challenge, and it isn't just government's responsibility, um, we need all sectors leaning in around the financing of it. And there are definitely ways to do it that stay true to corporations and employers' ideas, but I don't hear and see that conversation. Maybe Andrew and Paul do, um, but that's one of the things um, that we're definitely um, deeply engaged in is how do you bring more people in to this conversation? Because I find that's been a very sort of finite group of people um, and the conversation needs to expand um, where we're really all rowing in the same direction. We've got maybe uh, time for <clears throat> 30 second short sentences. What's your final message is the game show. Um, Andrew, what's your final message? 30 seconds, around 30 seconds, maybe less. I think we need everybody, uh, everyone has a role to play, whether you're a resident, whether you're, um, uh, whether you do this for a living or not. Uh, I think we all have a role to play in creating uh, neighborhoods that are open and welcome to everybody. And Don, just I want to know, I hope you have, I want to hear yours as well. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Don. My apologies. I kept raising my hand by accident in there. So no, I, I agree with Andrew. I mean, this really is going to take a partnership. And to Kim's point, and we do need sort of the major employers to actually own this and say, this is a challenge for us. It's one thing for an umbrella organization to say, well, generally speaking, the business community, but I think if you know a major employer in in health or in, you know, I don't want to name names, as Kim said, I don't want to name a specific, but I think there is an acknowledgement. Part of, and this is the plan directors and cog that we've been wrestling with in the moment right now is we're still in COVID, right? We're still living through the pandemic. And I will tell you, I'm part of a HUD national uh, sort of work group, what they call a top, st top start, because HUD is actually trying to get a handle on, is this just a, an aberration or is this an inflection point where people really are going to leave California and go to Idaho and work remotely for forever? I mean, and it's sort of an un unanswered question, right? But for us in this region, it's, it's, it's in our DNA. We want great communities. We, we want housing affordable to everyone in the right place. I can't really add any more than I've already said. I'm going to give you the last word since we're <laughs> one minute at time. So Don, close us out. Well, I think the critical message I'd like to leave is that for those of us in this audience, 
we all have to leave our fingerprints on this result. The, the change that we want, we have to become. Uh, so I'm going to encourage everyone to pitch in so that people like our panelists, and I want to thank them, Andrew Trueblood, Paul Desjardins, and Kimberly Driggins, um, don't have to do this alone. It's too big a lift. Um, and I want to thank the National Capital Area Chapter for allowing us to have this panel. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. Really appreciate it. Um, sorry for what happened in the chat. Um, we try to address it as quickly as we can. And sorry to all those who are in attendance. This has been a great session, and we really appreciate it. Thank you.